Hello and welcome to the program. Kyiv is preparing to host the Eurovision Song Contest for the second time in the history of the event. And while the musical extravaganza is just a month away, the hype about the contest gets even bigger. Joining us in the studio today via Skype is William Lee Adams, editor-in-chief at Weebly Blogs. He has also written for the Financial Times, Newsweek, CNN.com, The New York Times and InStyle. So, uh, hello and thank you for joining us. Hello, thank you for having me. So, uh, Ukraine is preparing for the Eurovision Song Contest and Kyiv is going to host the event for the second time in the history of the event. Looking forward. Absolutely. I think Eurovision is always more interesting when it doesn't take place in Western Europe. In recent years, we've been in Sweden twice, we've been in Germany. And for a lot of Westerners, that's just less interesting. But going to Ukraine, a culture many people haven't experienced, is really titillating. And I think there are high hopes for a good time. So does this mean you are coming to Kyiv uh, to take a look at the contest itself? Absolutely. I'll be there for two weeks. We'll oh, be covering wow. rehearsals inside the International Exhibition Center and hopefully we'll get to leave and see the city as well. Great. Any particular performances you're looking forward at this year's event? Definitely Italy. They have a dancing ape, but this is not just silly. The song has a very nice message about our evolution from caveman to Chanel shopper. <laughs> He's talking about the dumbing down of society and how Westerners often turn to Eastern philosophy and inspiration to, you know, find their peace. But what are they really doing with it? OK, um, well, it's not a secret that Ukraine is hosting the Eurovision Song Contest for the second time this year. The first time was in uh, 2005. In one of your articles, you have mentioned that um, this time is going to be a challenge for Ukraine to host the Eurovision Song Contest. Could you dwell on that a little bit more? Yes, I think although expectations are high that Ukraine can put on a good show because they have the technical crew, they have the production staff, every year their Eurovision act looks amazing, there's been a lot of controversy surrounding the execution of the show, the financing of the show, certainly the resignation of the head of the state broadcaster last December sent a bit of negative PR into the atmosphere. And then with the mass resignation of 21 people on the organizing committee in February, I believe, it also got people worried. People thought, started saying, oh dear, is something wrong behind closed doors in Ukraine? What's going on? And the Western media has really jumped on this and it's been published all over the place. There's a lot of doubt uh, that Ukraine can pull it together. However, I think Ukraine will pull it together. In 2005, when your country was organizing Eurovision, you had the Orange Revolution going on. There's political turmoil. There was all sorts of fallout. And yet the show went ahead and Ukraine was able to get its act together. And I'm very confident that will happen again. But right now we have war going on in the eastern part of the country. Do you think that could come into way or... I'm hopeful that the values of Eurovision will discourage people from doing something nasty or for the, con for the conflict spilling over into Kiev itself. Certainly, we have to address the elephant in the room, which is the current ban of the Russian contestant. This exactly. is a rather... Speaking of controversy, <laughs> right? Absolutely. And I think no one emerges from this situation looking good. On the one hand, Ukraine has to respect its own laws, and indeed it has to uphold international law. No one recognizes the illegal annexation of Russia, you know, no Western organizations in any event. And for Ukraine to allow a contestant in who visited Ukraine illegally is highly controversial. However, you have to look at the optics of the situation, the perception. And for Ukraine to be seen banning a contestant who does live in a wheelchair and who does represent the theme of Celebrate Diversity creates a major PR disaster. Although political sympathies certainly lie with Ukraine, I think many people think the stronger act would have been to let her compete and say, OK, Russia may be playing dirty games. They may be creating a scenario to try to make us look bad. So we're going to take the high road, avoid it and let her in. At the same time, she sends a very powerful message about inclusion. And I think a lot of people think that message, someone in a wheelchair singing on this big stage, is more important than the geopolitical conflict in this instance. But this is not the first time that uh, somebody was performing at the Eurovision Song Contest being in a wheelchair. So it, it's not new. Wasn't it um, like a dirty step from Russia? 
I think that Russia was definitely looking for a way to get sympathy because unlike yeah. Ukraine, Russia is booed at Eurovision consistently. And so they thought, goodness, we're going to be in Ukraine where there's a lot of anti-Russian sentiment. So we need to send a sympathetic character. So you could call that a dirty trick, but that would assume they knew she had sung in Crimea. And I think they do know that she had sung in Crimea because yeah, they agree. vet their <laughs> contestants. So they were creating a scenario to try to make Ukraine look bad. Um, Again, everyone ends up looking bad in this situation. <laughs> Um, no matter how hard the organizers of the event always try to point out that Eurovision uh, does not have any ties to politics, somehow they end up tied to politics all the time. Could you comment? Absolutely. I think that whenever you have a single person representing a nation regarding anything, whether it's sports or culture, it becomes somewhat political because you become a symbol of your country. Yes. And with music and culture, it's even more so because you can express ideas through your music, through your lyrics. We can talk about Jamala, for instance. It is a personal story. Let's do that. You know, a very personal story about her family and the forced deportation of Crimean Tartars under Stalin. Mm -hmm. And I accept that's personal, but it's also political because yeah. it carries with it a lot of weight and a lot of history. I personally don't think we should be afraid to discuss these things. Ultimately, she had the best stage show. It was a very moving and beautiful performance. Whether it was political or not doesn't matter to me because people were gripped and people were with her and people felt the emotion and that's what's important. I don't think she was looking to start a geopolitical conflict, but I think she had an important story to tell. All right, um, coming back to the Controvers controversy uh, around the Eurovision Song Contest of 2017. Uh, there have been some problems about the tickets for the fan groups. Uh, there was information that there are no tickets for the fan groups for the first time in the, uh, in the history of Eurovision. Has that resolved for now already? So a compromise has been reached. There are fan packages available now, but not nearly as many as in the past. In the past, up to 2,000 or 2,500 fan packages were released. And I think this year the number is just 900. But initially it was zero. Uh, and this was quite shocking because Eurovision fans are the lifeblood of the contest. They keep the interest going all year round. They're the ones who stand at the front with the flags waving and give yeah. this the sense of the Olympic Games. This is not just X Factor or The Voice. This is, you know, nations competing against nations. And it's quite beautiful in a way to see people waving all the flags. And by not giving them fan packages, which would put them at the front, you might just have corporate people in suits. And that's not good TV. And it's not good for the contest. Um, speaking about this year's Ukrainian entry, O Torwald Band, what do you think of them? Recently, you've interviewed the band. What are your impressions? That's right. The lead singer is very charismatic and charming. He's got the piercings and the tattoos, and some people may be afraid, but he's actually a very warm person. And it was interesting. I said, what's your message for Europe? Mm -hmm. And he responded with a bad word I won't repeat, but essentially saying, don't listen to the news. <laughs> he was trying to say, people are saying many things about Ukraine right now, but come experience it for yourself and then talk about it. So I think he's a thinker. I don't think he's just a musician with a lot of piercings. He has a message. And his song is not necessarily my cup of tea. It reminds me of kind of American pop rock from when I was a teenager, so it sounds too familiar. But I like that Ukraine is sending him. It's different than what we might expect. Because Ukraine, I think, has always sent or usually sent female divas. And this is showing there are men too. Um, any chances of Ukraine winning this year too? Oh, I don't think so, unfortunately. <laughs> I think that the song, while it's original, is not necessarily made for Eurovision, which shows how brave the judges and the public of Ukraine are, because they're sending yeah. something they like rather than something they think would win. I think this year a Western country is going to win. I, I think the political controversies that's been stirred in recent weeks has turned a lot of people off to the idea of attending another Eurovision in the East. And that sounds horrible, because I would love to go and I am coming and I can't wait to come back again. <laughs> but I think the air is a little poisoned right now. All right, any forecasts on the winner of this year's Eurovision Song Contest? The bookies certainly say Italy is the clear favorite. So and your I favorite went... too, right? Absolutely. Okay. I went to a concert in London on Sunday and 21, 22 of the acts were performing and it, all the favorites were there, Italy, Belgium, Bulgaria, and Italy got the biggest response. The audience went crazy. 
It's just a very good feel-good number at a time we could all use a bit of feel-good music. All right, thank you so much for such a wonderful conversation. It was great to have you. That was William Lee Adams, editor-in-chief at Weebly Blogs. Thank you so much for watching and goodbye. Yeah.